Great. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first edition of uh, Startup and Angel uh, Online. Um, my name is uh, Leo Denes. I'm the founder of Australians and uh, co-founder of uh, Startup and Angel. Uh, originally an event series we started back in 2016 uh, we, that has now uh, taken place in uh, over 12 countries, uh, mainly in uh, Asia, Pacific and uh, Africa. Um, and today, obviously, uh, given the, the current scenario where we can't actually run physical events, uh, we've actually taken this opportunity to explore, uh, you know, the digital world. Um, and go online. Uh, so big disclaimer, this is our first event. Uh, you know, we'll do everything we can so it goes as smoothly as possible. Um, we've got an amazing lineup and obviously a very relevant theme uh, talking uh, about the impact of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak for uh, international uh, scale-ups. Okay, uh, so we'll definitely build, uh, take your feedback during, after the event, uh, you know, to, uh, to see how we can um, take the opportunity, uh, you know, to run digital events and replicate uh, what we've been doing in the real world uh, online. Um, so today uh, with me, <coughs> I have uh, three international uh, experts, very international experts. Uh, we'll have uh, Cynthia, Luis and Neil, uh, they'll be uh, obviously given uh, an opportunity to uh, tell us a bit more uh, about them. Uh, in the audience, uh, we have um, actually uh, probably two thirds of the audience are uh, startup founders uh, in, you know, kind of early stage and then 20% um, founders and exec from scale ups. Uh, with uh, the, the remaining being uh, a mix of uh, investors, uh, you know, people working in international trade, uh, as well as uh, a number of corporate executives. Uh, also today, obviously, because of uh, the initial um, timeline of this event, uh, it's nine o'clock in Australia. Uh, we actually have 80%, roughly 80% of the audience from Australia. Um, actually, a number of people from Adelaide, where we were supposed to be uh, last night for the for the launch in Adelaide uh, at Lot 14. So thanks for joining us early, and you know, uh, sorry we missed you last night. Um, uh, a number of people from Melbourne, where we run over eight events over the last couple of years, and uh, and Sydney. Uh, we also have. Uh, you know, a number of international guests and, you know, that's the exciting part, I suppose, uh, with uh, running digital events is we don't have any barriers anymore. Uh, so we've got a, a guest from Dubai, uh, Mexico, uh, a couple of people from uh, Cyprus, uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Singapore. Uh, so thank you for uh, waking up bright and early for us or not going to bed so uh, uh, early. Um, so, <clears throat> without further ado, I'll uh, get um, Cynthia, uh, who's been, uh, who's actually been speaking back in October uh, as part of our event on uh, actually inter with an already an international lens. Uh, and Cynthia, yeah, has been a, a top speaker at many of our events. Um, so, Cynthia, tell us a bit more about uh, you and you know the uh, your organization. Thanks, Leo. Hey, everyone. Great to be with you this morning. Uh, Cynthia Deren's my name. I am the founder of Deren & Associates. We're an international business consultancy. And what we do is we help CEOs to create and execute game-changing international strategies so that they can scale internationally and really amplify the impact that their organization has in the world. And uh, last time I spoke in October, the world was a very different looking place. So um, some stuff's definitely gone down. <laughs> Since then, I'm looking forward to talking about that today. Thanks for being with us. And now we've got uh, Luis from uh, Receipt Bank. Hi, Luis. Hi, Leo. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Um, at last panel, I, I got a chance to, to chat with Cynthia as well. So it's nice to see you again, Cynthia, and, and good to meet you, Neil. Uh, my, my quick background is, as you can tell, very Aussie. Uh, not really. Uh, I'm uh, very, very American. Um, used to work for Intuit QuickBooks. Uh, so I've been in sort of the fintech space for a bit. I've now been leading Receipt Bank uh, Australia and now APAC 
for the last year and a half. And um, it's been absolutely life, you know, life changing type stuff uh, recently. We're a very global company. And so working from home and doing Zoom is, is certainly second nature to us. Uh, but, you know, th this is really accelerating some secular trends already and making things even more exciting. So anyway, we're, we're excited. If you ever want to just take pictures of receipts, never touch a receipt because a receipt might uh, transmit COVID, you know, think about Receipt Bank. Uh, give me a call. Great. And last but not least, uh, we've got uh, Neil uh, from AirWellX based in uh, Melbourne. Hi, Neil. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And, and uh, yeah, good morning or good evening to those uh, attendees. Um, so I'm Neil, Head of Growth for AirWallox. Um, so AirWallox is an Australian fintech company, and we help businesses scale uh, domestically and globally. Uh, so we provide financial services like bank accounts, cards, um, you know, international payments, payment gateways, um, all digitally uh, and very easy to, to um, create. Um, so really taking out the need to go to a branch. Uh, so that's kind of what we do. Um, and very excited here to share some of the lessons that we've had experienced in our offices. We're a global company with offices all over the world um, and in China as well. Uh, so we've had some really good lessons that we've learned uh, from our China office. Fantastic. Thank you so much all, uh, you know, for making the time and uh, sharing your uh, expertise uh, with the audience today. Uh, really, really delighted. Um, so, um, you know, maybe as we uh, move through, uh, obviously, the the first kind of uh, obvious question, um, we launched a poll in the background for attendees, uh, you know, to give us a bit of an insight on all the coping with, uh, you know, kind of working from home. Um, so you should uh, see the poll uh, hopefully arrive yeah, on your screen and we'll see uh, the, the results. So we'll, we'll cover that uh, as you uh, answer. So um, maybe first, so first question for, for you, Neil, um, you know, how is your organization reacting to the crisis? You know, what, what has changed? And, you know, do you see any, any difference um, on, on some of the market you're, you're in um, today? Yeah, so I think a, a couple, probably a couple of things. One is, you know, we, we have an office in China. And so from our organization, we've actually been very lucky to learn some of the lessons um, from China, our China office. So, you know, the working from home kind of processes around using Zoom, around using Slack, uh, we've taken a lot of those learnings. Um, you know, working from home has been a little bit of a challenge, um, but being kind of a global company, we, you know, it, it is second nature to us, like, like Louis said. Um, but some of the little things help, right? Like, you know, when you're on Zoom, we try to always have our video on. So you always feel like, you know, you're talking to, to someone um, in person. We kind of have uh, Zoom socials where everyone plays around with their virtual background, a little bit of fun. Um, we have a Slack channel that kind of has some you know, funny moments from working from home, especially with kids. So really just trying to bring that kind of community element um, in the office. And that's been really good for us from a, from a working home from home perspective. Uh, and in terms of the industry perspective, look, we've definitely kind of seen some winners and losers starting to emerge. Um, we're very active in the online travel space um, and that's definitely taken a big hit. Um, but we're also very active in e-commerce and that's taken a massive growth, right? So we're kind of seeing these sudden emerges kind of winners and losers um, from an industry perspective. And as a business, you know, we're always keeping adaptability top of mind. And we actually view this as a really big opportunity for us to think about what are some of these long-term trends? How can we adapt our business and come out of this situation stronger? You know, so we're really doubling down on that e-commerce sector, which we think will actually be fundamentally changed um, in six to nine months. And fantastic. Thank, thanks, for, uh, thanks for this, Neil. Uh, Luis, uh, you know, obviously, uh, as you mentioned, Receipt Bank is, you know, pretty, pretty global with office in uh, APAC, North America, UK. Um, you know, or, or as your organization uh, reacted to the crisis, um, you know, and, and same thing, like, you know, do you see any kind of patterns or difference uh, based on the different geographies? Yeah, let me answer it from three different perspectives, Leo. So I'll answer from the employee perspective of Receipt Bank. We'll talk about our, our direct partners who are accountants and bookkeepers, and then we'll talk about their clients because it's almost like, you know, different things have changed in each of them. Uh, first and foremost, I think, as you mentioned, we have offices in the UK, South Africa, France, the US, Canada, 
and in Sydney, and so and even Bulgaria. So Zoom is something that we've been using for the last year and a half. Uh, Slack is something that we've been using for a bit. So none of that changed. Frankly, we all decided to go and work from home just about three weeks ago, and so we've been doing this across every single geography at exactly the same time. And um, you know, we figured out some of the the tricks of the trade, Neil. You know, around leveraging Zoom, leveraging fun stuff, bringing your personal life, you know, having your kids come up to those, those Zoom socials, having virtual drinks, you know, at 4.30, you know, on a Friday, that type of thing. So that's from a colleague perspective, um, you know, not a ton has changed. I think the only other thing I would add is we use uh, Salesforce as our single source of truth. And so the concept of having a cloud solution where you can manage your team virtually is really, really helpful. So we can go into that a little more in depth. From a, an accountant and bookkeeper perspective, um, we're a solution that is very much sort of cloud driven. And so it, it's really changing the way many of our partners, accountants and bookkeepers, think about their accounting software. You know, some of them were literally still using desktop software until a few weeks ago. Now everybody's going, wow, okay, cool. I've heard about this cloud thing. Now I'm definitely on. So that changes their perspective. And once they change their perspective around cloud accounting, we become much more relevant. And so if anything, you know, they, they get the concept of, wow, I need a solution that I can use working from home. The third, the, the third topic is their clients, small business clients, they're, they're really hurting. And so to Neil's point, there are some you know, verticals that are just getting uh, decimated. And so that's creating a little bit of pressure because accountants and bookkeepers may get the call of, listen, I can't pay you what I used to pay you. Now I can only pay you half of what I used to pay you. And so um, you know, that, that puts a little bit of pressure on the business, but I would say net net, you know, we're, we're holding our ground. And when we come out of this thing, it's going to be a lot of people going, wow, um, technologies like this that enable remote work and cloud are the way to go. Great. Fantastic. And, uh, so Cynthia, from your, your, your perspective, I think you were um, kind of already familiar with, with uh, kind of the working from home scenario. So from, from your perspective, what is um, the key impact to date um, you know, on your organization or your, your kind of clients? Yeah, I mean, look, as you say, Leo, we've been doing, we've been, my team's been virtual for the last three years. So, you know, we've got people in about four or five time zones. So from that point of view, <clears throat> basically no change at all. So there hasn't been much of, a, much of a switch for us. I think what we have seen more is that people are putting their international plans on hold because there is so much uncertainty that, that people don't feel confident to make decisions. Um, you know, I've got clients and I've got contacts that had to cancel attendance at trade shows uh, you know, all the trade shows everywhere in the world pra practically for the rest of the year are now off. Uh, and so people are having to make really big adjustments in terms of how they work. I've got one client who did all of their marketing via trade shows and they've suddenly gone, Gah, what are we going to do? And so uh, although in one way that's a bit of a shock, it's also provided an opportunity for them to now turn around and say, you know what, we have needed a, a digital marketing strategy for a long time now we've never done it because we're always too busy um let's put that time those 12 weeks that we were going to spend at tw uh, trade shows and the quarter of a million dollars that was going to go into trade shows and let's take that and put that against digital marketing okay and uh so maybe uh, maybe a question for you obviously you're quite familiar with markets such as you know the, the middle east yeah. uh you know africa i mean do you um in terms of geographies, you know, from from your from your scope, uh, you know, do you see the, like similar trends uh, across the uh, the globe, or you know, are there kind of still pockets where um, you know there are there are still some opportunities to do you know the traditional way of business? No, I think there's very little at the moment. I mean, I have spoken to people from uh, Europe, from India, from the States, from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, everybody's locked down. I mean, I had a conversation with a lady the other day who had launched a line of food products out of Trinidad and Tobago, wanted to sell them across Africa in particular, but couldn't, um, couldn't actually even send samples out to prospective clients because there is no 
postal service at the moment. You know, there's no economy, international air service practically anywhere in the world. And so, no, I think um, in most sectors, traditional ways of doing business are pretty firmly off the table. Unless, of course, you, knew, you know, you've got a supply chain that is established and hasn't been disrupted and your stuff can continue to move around. So food, food and beverage might be one where there's been less disruption, uh, especially out of Australia. The, the government has actually put in place a $110 million for facility for exporters of high quality uh, food that needs a cold supply chain to actually sell that produce into key markets. And then the, the aircraft that are coming back with that are bringing back uh, vital medicines and supplies that we need in Australia. So that's one area that's maybe seen a little bit less disruption, but on the whole, we're talking, you know, massive disruption of um, across all sectors of industry. Thank you. All right, thanks. And so maybe for Neil, so um, as reviewing some of the questions, thanks, thanks for some of you kind of, um, you know, already uh, fueling the, the question. Um, so maybe question for you, uh, Neil, uh, you know, about China, maybe uh, specifically, you know, you know, whether that's kind of, uh, you know, startup or kind of any, any business in China, what's, what's your take? Um, you know, obviously we hear that, you know, China is, uh, is kind of getting back to, uh, to business almost full speed. You know, what's, what's your take what, um, on, your, on your clients there? Yeah, I'd say with China, look, China is very fast paced, like super fast paced. And, and they've actually had a lot, lot of lessons from historical events. So SARS, right, in, in early 2000s is very similar to the corona, obviously just not on that global scale. And, and what you found with SARS was that it was actually the catalyst for Alibaba and JD.com, these massive e-commerce players, accelerated the trend um, to, going, to going kind of digital. Um, SARS also played a massive role in 10 cents rise, right? Going from you know, cash to cashless, to digital payments. And China, if you haven't been to China, it is basically 100% digital payments. Now. Like, there's, there's zero cash. And some of these kind of events have actually helped accelerate. And so the Chinese businesses in general are very savvy that they see these trends and they're very fast to jump on top of them. So, you know, as soon as this um, kind of hit, mobile gaming went crazy. Like all these people, right, started to come up with different mobile games where historically it was kind of one or two big players, a lot of these smaller players have started coming up, right? So the Chinese kind of uh, you know, ecosystem is very quick to adapt. Having said that, um, you know, it's still very hard for funding uh, for, the, for the newer players. So what you usually find is these bigger uh, companies like Tencent are very good at spinning up new products uh, and new ideas and still take that market share. Um, we are still seeing small, medium businesses struggle, right? It's just hard, especially if you don't have a strong cash flow position. It's, it's very, very hard. Like we're hearing in the industry that at least, you know, 10 to 20% of small businesses have actually closed, right? And that's just the unfortunate situation. Um, but, but in that, there's also this kind of, I guess, opportunity for other businesses where they potentially have some cash to adapt, right, and, and work on some of these opportunities. Um, so, you know, e-commerce continues to thrive, um, mobile gaming becoming very big, online education very big. So some of these industries are the ones that we're really seeing starting to, to grow very, very fast in China and starting to find new, you know, uh, I guess, new competitors are starting to emerge uh, in these industries. Great, thanks for uh, thanks thanks for this. Um, I mean, uh, maybe maybe we jump to the kind of the next part, you know, around you know, obviously the the, the world we in or like you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, borders have have no closed. Um, you know, companies like a number of companies, you know, uh, actually cutting costs. You know, in in Australia in particular, I must say that. You know, everyone is doing their best, kind of, to uh, um, you know maintain their uh, their workforce, and they, there is you know a lot of initiatives uh, from the government, uh, you know, to help kind of keep uh, keep jobs. Um, you know, most countries, as you mentioned, uh, you know, are now facing recession or in recession. Um, so, what does that mean in terms of uh, kind of global strategy? Uh, you know, or yeah, growth strategy and global strategy in general, uh, you know, in, in this kind of crisis scenario. Um, so maybe, um, Cynthia, uh, you know, I know you've got a very kind of controversial view on, uh, on this, if you want to, uh, 
kind of give us or your your input on uh, global expansion in, in in this new world? Yeah, sure. Look, um, and as you say, my view on this probably is a bit controversial. I know a lot of people uh, feel deeply uncomfortable with the idea of doing anything in the international space at the moment, but <clears throat> I believe that. Um, especially for companies where things have slowed down, if that means that there is extra bandwidth and extra time for the leadership team to do strategic thinking, this could potentially be a once-off opportunity that you get to work on your international strategy. So you guys will know as company founders that things are usually moving very, very rapidly and you don't get much time to zoom up to a 30,000 foot view and actually put in that work. When things are slower, that's a time that you actually can think about what you want to do internationally. Now, I'm not saying you should go ahead and pull the trigger on it right now, but I think now is a great time to actually put that plan in place so that you have a baseline and so that you have something to tweak. Um, obviously, there are you know hundreds of thousands of companies around the world and if you as a founder are going through this current crisis and you've paused all planning and decision making, you might think that you're standing still, but what you're actually doing is you are moving backwards. And that's because when we're going to emerge from this crisis at different speeds. So as we've already seen, you know, China is already starting to open back up. Asia will probably be one of the first parts of the world that opens back up completely. There are plenty of smart people there who have got their planning underway already. And so they'll come out of the blocks ready to go, ready to hit it hard, ready to, you know, put more of their global strategy in place. For companies that have sat on their hands for the whole time, they're going to be a long way behind because while they are standing still, everybody else is moving forward and so effectively they're going backwards. And so, as I say, while I'm not saying you should go ahead and pull the trigger on a massive international expansion right now, uh, I think that if you are thinking about going global, you need to still be working on the strategy for that and looking at where the opportunities are because um, you know we've seen massive consolidation in some industries that's going to create a huge amount of opportunity in other spaces so uh, if you wanted to split it out broadly into movement of goods and movement of people <clears throat> we've seen supply chains around the world hugely disrupted when it comes to goods that's going to create opportunities in the manufacturing space because companies are going to need to diversify their supply lines so that they don't end up in the situation which so many of them are facing at the moment, which is that they just can't, uh, they can't get the product that they need to supply their customers. And so as a risk mitigation, people are going to be looking around for, for supplies of the same things in other places. So I see an opportunity there. Um, on the service provider industry, suddenly barriers to entry have come down. So as, as you'll know, a lot of people used to be quite reticent about consuming services virtually, you know, uh, coming to virtual events. It was always hard to get people along to stuff. Now we don't have an option. This is the way that we can get together. And that, that means that as people get used to attending things real time, as opposed to face to face, they're also going to be more comfortable consuming services this way. And so that provides a massive opportunity. Suddenly you can serve people anywhere in the world and reach them with your message. That's a massive opportunity. The flip side is that everybody else can do the same thing. And so you have to get really smart about this and you have to develop a fantastic offering that speaks to people and is differentiated from what everybody else is going to do. Otherwise, you'll find there are people coming in from all around the world to take your market share. Leo, do you mind if I jump in with just a little bit of a, an investment perspective? Yes, Chris. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you've heard this one before, buy low, sell, you know, buy low, sell high. Um, if anybody's sitting on any sort of cash or, you know, a liquid currency, it's a great time to look at mergers and acquisitions. And so, you know, I, what I would assume is, you know, I can tell you, we as a company are thinking about it. You know, any investor out there is startups, you know, might need to consider different exit strategies. And, and this time, you know, when you, you know, potentially, I think to Cynthia's point, a way to enter a new market might be, Hey, at the right price, I'm willing to, you know, take a risk on a new market. And so, uh, very, very interesting opportunities. I think Neil brings up a great point just around people are now starting to think of those great sort of next ideas. But I think right now there's just going to be, you know, a lot of, a lot of activity. If you're sitting on cash or, you know, liquid currency, uh, I think it's potentially a pretty good time to put it to work. Um, I would, the, the only other perspective I would have on that one, Leo, is, um, you know, we have to rely on virtual tools to do stuff. We have to rely on, you know, 
changing our, our marketing mix. So to Cynthia's point, we used to spend something like 40 to 50% of our dollars on, on physical events. We've absolutely moved, you know, some of that, some of those dollars to digital marketing. And frankly, some of that we've chosen to save, right? Because depending on how you think about this, you know, you may be looking at this with a three month horizon or a six month horizon, but in a world where we're all trying to manage cash and grow, you know, if you have a perspective that the growth is going to be pretty stunted for six months, you better be saving cash right now, or you're setting yourself up for, for failure. Yeah. And, and I might chime in as well. I think on Cynthia's point, like, you know, if, if you do, and Louise, well, if you, if you have cash and you're thinking global now could actually be the best time to actually get talent globally, right? Where, where, other companies are potentially cutting, cutting talent where all other, other there's uncertainty for, for, for certain um, people, they might be looking for other opportunities. It could actually be a really good opportunity to make that first hire in the international market. Right. Um, and on the marketing point, like, you know, I totally agree that, you know, you do need to reevaluate your marketing strategy. Um, but you might want to not just go digital, but actually think about the ROI on some of the investments you make. So if one example from our end is that we're actually doubling down on content, right? Because we know that content lasts. And especially in this environment, people want to consume content. There's a lot of uncertainty. People want as much information as they can. And so we've kind of accelerated our content strategy and seen some really, really good um, signs already uh, on that. So there's some of the things I think people can start thinking about. But, but I think the overall message is like, don't be inactive. Like Cynthia said, be active, start thinking about the opportunities um, and, and start kind of, you know, planning ahead so that in three, six months, you're in a really good position. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh... Thanks, thanks all for your, for your input. So maybe just a quick update to say that, uh, I mean, at least Cynthia, you've been uh, heard loud and clear. I mean, the, the result of the second poll and thanks to, uh, you know, all of you who uh, kind of um, voted, but we've got, yeah, uh, the question was, what do you think, do you think today uh, is the best time to create your international strategy? And we've got 60% with uh, hell yes and 40 percent with uh, maybe but it looks scary um so no no one actually think you're crazy cynthia in terms of uh <laughs> looking at the international strategy i mean you know for you know a little bit about kind of um, my, my experience as well you know obviously uh the whole vision of all company australians you know was to uh, i mean still is to be a, an international bridge you know for uh international uh, tech startups, uh, you know, coming to, um, to APAC, to Australia, uh, and vice versa, you know, helping, you know, Australian startup kind of go global uh, in various markets. And, you know, definitely, you know, the first reaction with all the border um, closing down, you know, having to actually help a number of people kind of go back to their home countries uh, over the last three weeks was really kind of daunting and scary. And now what we see is actually a number of people who've kind of went back to their own countries, you know, keep on working remotely. You know, we see kind of the, the power also to have companies working around the clock, you know. Uh, you know, when you check out, you know, a few day in Australia, then someone else, let's say in Europe, in France, uh, you know, can get, start their day. Uh, so there are a number of things where, you know, uh, obviously we see actually the, the benefits. You know, obviously, as you mentioned, um, you know, companies are looking at ways to actually, you know, save cash and, you know, make cash last, um, but also looking at, you know, better ROI, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, optimizing, you know, marketing spend and things like this. And actually, we must also say that, you know, there is maybe, you know, the 10, 20 percent companies that are really boosted and becoming more relevant than ever, uh, you know, in this kind of new either digital world or as you mentioned um e-commerce uh, uh world you know um so maybe we'll jump to uh kind of the, the the next part uh you know around opportunities you know opportunities and uh, how will the the new world look like i think that's you know number of um questions that have uh, that have been asked uh, definitely before the event as well uh, you know, what, what the new world would look like, um, you know, you, you know, some of you kind of started to touch on new opportunities, you know, for fintech, for e-commerce, uh, you know, anything that is um, going, you know, helping with, you know, going paperless. 
Uh, maybe if we can kind of reinforce the message, explore new ways, you know, around all the new ways of working as well, you know, with the working from home. Um, you know, so maybe uh, Neil, you know, for, for you, and you, you kind of touch that around, you know, opportunities, what's, what are the key opportunities you see arise? Um, and, you know, if you had a crystal ball, uh, when we, you know, if, if we put another event in six months, what would, what, what would it look like? What would this yeah. look like? Yeah, so I think maybe I'll tackle in kind of two pieces. One is kind of, I guess, uh, more growth orientated and one is maybe more cost orientated. Um, on the growth side, I think, you know, without a doubt, that transition to digital is just going to be even more pronounced. Um, we've had clients, you know, uh, I've got, we've got a client who uh, runs the Pokegate store, so Poke Bowls. Uh, you know, brick and mortar, uh, obviously very much hit by the, the, the current situation and they've pivoted their store to pure online and selling packets of prepackaged poke bowls that you can just, you know, uh, whip up really, really fast in the kitchen. Um, and that's actually just gone really, really crazy. They've said that they've grown a lot of sales and at the same time actually cut a lot of their fixed costs. Um, you just see more and more these transitions of kind of previously brick and mortar businesses uh, going digital and actually seeing how amazing digital is. Um, you know, you're seeing behaviors change. People are getting more and more comfortable with, with buying things online. Amazon, right, which I think had a pretty rough launch in Australia, you know, doing really well. Uh, and then online education as well, right? Like more and more kind of this virtual uh, learning, kind of people being more comfortable with webinars. I think that trend is just, is just happening. And so I think with any business, they just need to have a digital strategy. They really need to think about digital, uh, digital first, um, how do they kind of get that muscle uh, capability growing? And the great thing is as soon as you go digital, going uh, global becomes a lot easier as well, right? As soon as you go digital, you know, obviously the internet is, is the thing that brings down barriers. You now have a lot of uh, products that allows you to sell very easily uh, to other countries. Um, the second piece I think is more cost. And I think Louis touched on this as well, is that, um, you know, as businesses think about managing costs, how can they use technology uh, to drive efficiency, both from a cost perspective uh, and from a, a process operational perspective. So cloud, right? Going cloud is is obviously very beneficial. Airwallet is all about, you know, modernizing that financial services tech stack, making it very easy to, to give a, a, a corporate card to employees, you know, all around the, uh, the country or around the world, being able to kind of limit spend, but still empowering them. Uh, you know, we also help, you know, create, accounts overseas for businesses very easily or create a payment gateway um, that saves them on FX. So, so I think there is this conversation now that business say, hey, can I adapt the latest technologies to save costs and generate operational efficiencies? And I think this is a good time for businesses to think both top line, right? How do I change? Um, but also bottom line, how do I adopt new technologies to drive some of these efficiencies? So in six months time, I'm actually in a very, very good place uh, for my business. And I might just jump in and add that I think that's really important uh, in this whole managing virtual teams piece. So, you know, there are a lot of companies that are not used to working with all their employees split up. They've always had everybody in the same office and they're struggling to come to, come to grips with it. But there is a massive opportunity if you use platforms like Slack and Trello for you to actually transform the way your team works. I mean, I've, I've seen this in our own organisation. We have become vastly more effective and more efficient over the space of three or four years uh, working virtually. So we do way better now. The whole team split up ac across five time zones than we ever did when we had 10 people in the same office together. So I'll, I'll uh, if you don't mind me jumping in. So Leo, just, uh, you know, I think the question was, you know, what opportunities do you see arising? So Neil touched on some secular trends and, you know, I, I moved from the US to Australia just 18 months ago and if, if you're not aware, in the U.S., most people pay for the rent in a, with a check. Now, people carry wads of cash in their wallet. This will change. You know, that, that change has been happening sort of, you know, slowly. It's clearly happening dramatically. I think you guys see it in, you know, even stores in, in Australia. We're not exchanging cash anymore. Obviously, we'd already been, you know, the dimension of pay wave and all this stuff. That's just going to accelerate further. You know, cash will become scarcity. I think... Um, we are, we're in a business where we're basically helping uh, businesses become, you know, go paperless. And honestly, you know, people are, are resonating with this, you know, this concept of, you know, like, why would I deal with all this paper that I might even, you know, might transmit disease. So, you know, why not 
adopt these cloud solutions that help you do more efficient work, enable remote work. So all of that goes without saying. Uh, I think thirdly, there's going to be a lot of companies who are used to, you know, when they looked at their P&L and go, yeah, I, I should spend 30% of my costs on, on rent. A lot of people are going to be rethinking that. You know, if you are come even close to figuring out how to motivate a team and keep track of their productivity online, many people are going to go, you know what, until we have 30 to 40 people, like we're just going to work virtually and save ourselves 25% cost. So that, that's a massive change in terms of not just how startups, but I think, you know, general, you know, even larger businesses are going to rethink how they go to market. And I think that the final piece is, you know, think about Zoom. Zoom's like the innovation on Zoom is going to explode because everybody, you know, I, I would be surprised if it doesn't become a, a platform or an ecosystem where people start building innovation into it because, you know, in a year or two, we're going to be looking at this concept of, you know, four talking heads as so, you know, 2020, right? I mean, there's going to be so much more interaction, so much cooler stuff. You know, you got some great polls already going on, but trust me, you know, th this is going to be a massive um, platform. And, you know, now would, will it be Zoom? Will it be another competitor? Maybe, maybe not. But just how you drive engagement online, you know, that's where the innovation is going to come and that's going to change the way we do business. Yeah, virtual reality definitely uh, will make a, a lot of sense uh, in a scenario like this. Um, so we've been hammered by, uh, by question. I think we've got like 13 questions uh, open. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, obviously uh, everyone, uh, you know, in, in kind of this the change process, you know, we all go through um, phases. You know, we touch on 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 few uh, on few things, and uh, you know maybe um, Cynthia, uh, you know, because um, if you've got a, an example of you know a companies who, who um, pivoted um, and kind of not only kind of save their company but actually uh, you know kind of transform their company thanks to you know either this crisis or you know another um, opportunity. Uh, I think you mentioned, um, you know, kind of whether that's kind of a, a, a cider, a company uh, selling cider, but like, let's, can you, can you walk us through a, a case study of a traditional business? Um, yeah. So I can't, I, it's too early for me to say, you know, Hey, who's pivoted and, and we know for sure that it saved the company, but I can just talk about a few things that I've seen people doing. So, um, we were talking yesterday when we chatted, we were t I was mentioning that uh, I've been doing a little bit of work with a company that sells cider and um, traditionally they've sold through a venue and then they've sold to suppliers who've, who have actually then sold the cider at, at bars and pubs. And obviously they are extremely worried because there are no longer any bars or pubs open across Australia or anywhere else in the world that they sell. Um, <laughs> And so they said, well, look, we're, we're anticipating that there's going to be a crunch. We're just going to um, wait and see what happens. I encourage them to actually look around at what other people in the beverage space were doing. And the example that I picked was Vino Mofo, who um, some of the people on the call might know, which is run by Justin Dry. Now, um, that company had a pretty rocky genesis about 10 years ago, but it started to do very well. And since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, sales have gone through the roof. And the key here is that they sell wine online. Now, they're not the only seller of wine online, but they are um, a company that does wine sales online very, very well. And so they are saying, we have never seen anybody buying as much wine, um, you know, to consume at home as we are now. So it's been amazing for their business. My suggestion to the seller of cider was, okay, you know, cider is also an alcoholic beverage. Um, there might be a few hoops that you've got to jump, but clearly this is something that you can sell online rather than getting totally stressed because you can't sell to venues anymore. Why don't you quickly pivot? And, you know, you've told me that, you know, you can sell online. Why don't you try and amplify that quickly, get that rolling and get into the market for, um, you know, for, for cider sales coming to home. And they kind of said, well, yeah, maybe that's something we'll think about. So, I mean, there is one where I see an opportunity. Um, 
I was speaking to a fashion company a couple of uh, weeks ago. Now they were, um, they are a company that was very prepared for this crisis because they saw it coming. They'd already gone and asked for a rent holiday from uh, their landlords all around Australia for their retail stores. So they'd already had their rent paused. They'd been putting aside money and they did a very hard pivot into digital. So they basically took all their effort out of the retail bricks and mortar side of thing. And again, put it into digital. And they said, we foresee that this is going to be a rocky patch, but we're set up, you know, we're marketing, um, our marketing has pivoted to all be about uh, buying while you're in lockdown and spoiling yourself while you're in lockdown. So, you know, there's somebody who, who's kind of risen to that challenge as well. And then there's a company I mentioned that was doing all its marketing through trade shows. Um, I've got to catch up with them next week. So I'm not quite sure where they've landed on it, but when we last spoke, they said, hey, we were going to do trade shows. We now can't do trade shows, but we have, we know we usually spend a quarter of a million dollars in three months of the year on our trade shows. We've just got a massive chunk of resources, both in terms of time, manpower and money back that we can reinvest somewhere else. So, I mean, I am seeing and hearing examples from lots of different sectors about how people can do this. And I think there are a couple of three things that are key here. One is that you you know, you have the, the courage to do it because it is scary. You know, it's going to be uncharted territory for a lot of people, but you're courageous enough to do it. Uh, secondly, that you think outside the box. So you allow yourself to um, think in a very free ranging way and you take a, you just remove all the limitations that you have about, oh, we can't do this or we don't know how to do that or that would never work. Uh, and then thirdly, once you've done that exercise of thinking big, you put some very rigorous strategy around how you're going to do it and you make sure that you execute to a very high standard and that you are closing, tightening up feedback loops and testing and measuring what you're doing all the time so that you've got visibility on how your new strategy is going before it gets to the 15th of the month each month so that you're actually measuring leading indicators rather than just measuring lagging ones. I think there's a couple points that if I could just add on to that, uh, Leo. So yep. one is having visibility on metrics, numbers, leading indicators has never been more important, right? So we are lucky in that we've been using Salesforce for about eight years. So in our business, we're mostly a sales and marketing operation here in Australia. I know how many minutes on the phone our salesperson has been, right? How many pieces of business they've closed, how many people they've tried. I mean, you need that kind of stuff in today's world. So in that respect, highly recommend, you know, having platforms that enable you to get that sort of visibility. I think that's number one. I think number two, and, and you guys, you know, Neil referred to the concept of getting great quality talent has never been more important, you know, and, and it might be a great time to go get new quality, you know, great talent around the world. It's almost like the profile of the great talent is going to change. So what I mean by that is people who are great with numbers, because these platforms will become even more important, will become even, you know, that will become a more important quality or skill you're looking for. And secondly, you're going to look for people who can motivate others through the, this digital lens, right? Now, you, you've got some people who are great at doing that in person, but many organizations are not going to have office space. So how do you do that over Zoom? How do you do that over Slack? Uh, you know, it's, and it's almost like, you know, the, the, the great worker of the future is going to look a little bit different going forward. Definitely. I mean, uh, thanks Luis for, for sharing that. Obviously, uh, you know, being in the kind of talent acquisition business, I uh, echo what you say, uh, you know, and maybe we'll, uh, you know, I've always kind of encouraged people to, uh, you know, show that they've experienced managing CRM, you know, potentially naming a few they've been using. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the, the tools they've been using, and as you mentioned, there'll be uh, a change in the landscape of hot event tools. Uh, and also, it would be quite interesting as well to uh, display that you have experience kind of working from home or working remotely, uh, because that's definitely something, you know, more and more employers would be, uh, be looking. Um, I mean, recently, so I'll share a couple of things because Actually, recently, we actually closed two recruitment or actually three recruitment over the last three weeks. 
Um, one with uh, actually a, a company, I'll, I'll share the name Aircall, uh, which is an extension which actually integrates with uh, the like of Salesforce, HubSpot, but as well, um, you know, other platform, your uh, Zendesk. Um, and uh, basically, uh, they see a kind of a peak in um, actually request on their website because a number of companies, uh, you know, actually see the, the value you now of um, tracking this kind of productivity, recording conversation, getting additional data on, um, you know, to, to, to run their, their business, as you mentioned, not only for kind of productivity, but also kind of understand the whole uh, impact of this kind of new, uh, new world. You know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the conversion rate in an environment where people are spending less, uh, you know, may decrease, but uh, as a result, it's even more important to, um, to reach out. Um, and yeah, secondly, you know, as you mentioned, what we will also see is uh, like in the, the property industry, in the wish list of, you know, organization, but also us as residents, you know, the next time you're looking to, uh, you know, rent a flat or a, house, uh, or a home, you'll be looking differently around kind of this number of bedroom, you know, you may actually, the value of having a study may, you know, be important. Like where will I work in this place? Not where necessarily will I be sleeping? Um, so I don't know if you want to uh, add anything uh, to this, Neil. I mean, you, you mentioned about kind of international hire. Um, and, you know, I, I agree that there's, there's a number of uh, learnings here. Uh, before we jump into the, you know, some of the, the question from the audience. Yeah, I think I just echo, um, you know, what Louis said. I think, you know, the, the profile of talent um, is going to change. Um, so I think it is important just to, to think about, um, you know, the type of skills, the type of capabilities you need uh, in this new world. Um, and, and, you know, I think being a, a, co a strong communicator will be even more important, right, in this digital world. And also actually people having very strong uh, EQ. Like, you know, EQ is already very important when it comes to managing people, but even more so when you're not in the office, you can't really, I guess, get the physical cues, right? So you kind of need to be able to figure out, you know, what might this person be feeling? Um, you know, do you think they're like, you know, struggling a little bit and you need to be able to kind of read between the lines and sometimes it's very hard, but you know, even with Slack or, or VC, you can potentially say, Hey, I think this person might need um, a little bit of encouragement or might need a little bit more guidance. Um, so those skills become you know, critically important, um, as we, as we shift more towards this kind of you know, remote working, virtual, um, working kind of trend. You know, I, I just, I just think people's expectations change. And so what I mean by that is before <laughs> working from home, you know, this, this new normal, you know, I never thought about having like a daily meeting with my team because it felt like it might just, it might be too much. Like you don't want to be like micromanaging or you don't want to be, but now people actually love it. They really come to expect that it. it's their way to connect with others. And so again, expectations change dramatically. And I think to, to Neil's point, you know, we, we are all just going to have to figure out how to, get better at reading people on a screen. <laughs> you know, you're not seeing the rest of the body, but man, we're probably going to become a little bit more sensitive to that, that twitch of the eye or that, you know, like slight the roll of the, you know, the eyes that, that maybe you wouldn't have noticed before because this is all you've got to go on. So I think there's the EQ piece and then there's the, how good an you know, observer are you? Are you a, a truly active listener? Uh, because you know what, in a, in a, um, in a screen only world, um, it becomes clearer if people are truly listening or not. Um, yeah, and that, and that daily um, meeting thing is actually very um, true. So we, we implemented daily, what we call daily stand-ups um, probably a couple of weeks ago, and it's been a massive success. Like, I think in the office, people would have been like, you're micromanaging me. But in this virtual environment, people thrive on the kind of uh, being able to talk to someone, you know, kind of you know, talking a little bit about kind of the experience. Like it's just, it's just very, very important. Uh, and so it's kind of the ways of working and the rituals you have actually change. And look, we've, we've been doing that for, as I mentioned before, for the last three to four years. So we have a daily meeting every day without fail. We don't just have one meeting, but there is one daily check-in, even if it's just five or 10 minutes to find out what were people's wins from the pre previous day, 
what are their top three high value activities for today? And is there anything they're stuck on or need help with or want to throw around and talk about? And then we have a bit of time for people to put on the table anything else that they want to raise as a topic for discussion. And then if there are significant things, we create um, another separate meeting, which flows on directly from the first one with the relevant people, or we put aside a time later in the day to come back and meet on it. Uh, and it's incredible what you just the level of motivation and excitement you get from people when you let the team direct what's going to happen in the meeting and that opportunity is given every day so you're actually encouraging people to to get in and be highly invested in their work and what, what you're building together and i can attest to the fact you can do that even through a screen amazing all right. Thanks for this. I mean, I completely uh, echo as well. Uh, you know, I think um, you know more than ever, it's important to be connected with your with your with your team, um, and you know, have some have, have some rigor into it. Um, and uh, so, I'll just share now. I mean, I hopefully you can all see the the result of the poll now. Uh, but I think we um, uh, same thing. We uh, we have a positive note here. Uh, you know, and if, if anything, if this event has helped anyone to see uh, some opportunity, you know, and be convinced that there is, there is a bright side in this difficult situation, then it's a massive, uh, massive win. But yeah, we've got 50% of uh, the audience who think that there is a massive opportunity rising from uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And then, um, you know, 40%, you know, seeing, uh, you know, trying to focus on the, on the bright side. Um, and, you know, just like 10%, you know, actually still in this phase uh, where they're trying to, um, you know, understand and, and kind of uh, swallow, the, swallow the, the pill. Okay, we, we didn't get to ask everyone, you know, how long they think this situation is going to last. I think, you know, we all kind of keeping our, our fingers crossed. Um, so maybe before we, uh, we finish, um, there was... Uh, you know, another uh, question about, uh, you know, opportunities created, um, you know, kind of to, uh, to, save, uh, to save money, uh, you know, being obviously the, the rent and working from home. Uh, you know, is there any other key efficiency, you know, from your experience, maybe uh, Neil or Luis, uh, you've been looking at where you've been able to uh, um, save, some, save some bucks or redirect the, the spend? Want to go, Neil? Yeah, so I think I think for us, um, so obviously on my side, a lot of it's around the the marketing. Um, so we we've been kind of very looking at heavily at kind of our marketing and looking at ROI a, a lot more. Um, so we, we're probably you know trying to um, cut down a little bit on paid marketing just because you know we we think that the ROI might, might not be that good because some businesses could potentially uh, fall over. Um, and like I said, we're really investing in content and SEO. So that's just kind of longer lasting, right? Like anything you invest now will last for, for potentially years, years to come. Um, the other thing we're looking at is, you know, just international FX, right? Um, all businesses these days have a lot of subscriptions that are charged in US dollars and you get whacked like, you know, 3% each transaction. Um, so, so there are tools out there. So, you know, we actually have a, a product ourselves. So we're trying to transition a lot of our, um, kind of finance into our own product where we don't kind of have that FX uh, hit on transactions um, or kind of on the, on the conversion as well. So they're kind of some of the things we're, we're looking at. You know, I, I hate to answer with some of the same answers, but uh, let's go with that. Um, I think Cynthia mentioned the concept of some people used to spend a, a decent amount of their marketing dollars on physical events. And I think, you know, our, our focus on ROI has just gotten even tighter. So I think we're going to be a lot more selective about how we do, you know, physical events. You know, we, the, the, the return's got to be there or, you know, it's more like you're going to test until it's proven and then go there. I think, um, you know, the, the only other thing I'd say is, yeah, just take a really close look at, you know, every, every line item. Like, does it, does it really bring an ROI? If not, you know, we're, we've been looking at things as simple as, do we really need that subscription? You know, could we potentially consider a slightly different tool? And so I'll just, if you don't mind, one of the questions that, that was left, Leo, that we haven't answered, I'll just give you guys one more tool that I, we found really helpful, Loom. So kind of like Zoom, but with an L. It enables you to do like basically personalized screen captures videos. Uh, and so you can create something specifically for you, Leo. You know, hey, and, and it's my face talking while I'm showing you the screen, maybe walking you through something. 
a very, very helpful tool. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it, it is amazing to me how quickly in this world, the best solutions very quickly come to light. People are very, you know, comfortable sharing best practices. Cynthia, would you want to share a tool as well? I'm just trying to think. I mean, look, I, I like Loom as well, Vidyard. Um, I think, I mean, obviously everybody knows about Zoom and Slack, but I think Trello is also massively valuable for keeping the team on track. Um, and my recommendation is that everybody gets Trello set up as a Kanban system for their, um, for their team. There's an awesome book on Kanban philosophy that I just can't remember the name of, uh, but it's, I think it might be called like personal Kanban by Jim Benson, but the philosophy is all around that Japanese Kanban philosophy and managing workflow. Trello does that really well. I mean, there are other things that are similar like Asana, but um, having a tool where you can visualize everybody's work, and then limit the number of things that anybody is working on at any one time, that's going to be massively helpful for productivity and that's going to cut costs because it, it improves team efficiency and it reduces rework. I've just yeah. heard of this other one. Oh, I'm sorry, Neil. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I was just said, I was going to say, I've just heard of this other one to manage your kind of financial life uh, receipt bank. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so we, we actually use Google Suite for, uh, for our business. I don't know if other businesses are doing that, but actually just the whole kind of shared doc, shared uh, slides is yeah. actually just super useful, right? In a meeting, you pull it up, everyone can contribute at the same time. Um, super collaborative. And we've actually found that even more useful um, in this kind of virtual environment. Definitely. All right. So, so, so thanks. So, um, just saying, so we, we had, obviously, I think we covered a number of questions. There were some recurring questions around kind of funding, you know, for startup in the current environment. The very good news is that's the big focus of our next event next week. Okay. So we will have a, a panel of uh, VC, uh, not only from, uh, uh, Australia, but actually have, you know, someone from Artesian, which, which has a, a very big footprint um, in the whole APAC market, as well as um, an investor uh, originally from uh, UK, uh, now based in Singapore. Um, so we'll have, uh, we'll be able to kind of cover the, um, the impact, you know, from a, you know, founding perspective, what does that change for your business plan? Um, so, I mean, one of the key next step is to take this whole good energy in a number of lessons learned, um, you got today, interesting trends, see what it means for, uh, you know, your business, your, your vision and, and, um, and, you know, next week you will be able to, um, have the investor, uh, view, um, and, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, question. Uh, some other question we'll see or we can uh, help uh, answer that. Um, so uh, we know kind of uh, almost on time, uh, which is an order for Startup and Angel because we always went going over time and then we had time for drinks and everything. Um, but, uh, you know, I just really wanted to, uh, to thank our speakers, you know, all of you, uh, all the attendees, uh, you know, who uh, kind of made the, made the time. Hope you uh, got a lot out of it. Uh, definitely had a, a lot. Really wanted to uh, thank my, my team, uh, you know, especially uh, Anael, or um, marketing and event manager, Mary, uh, who is now uh, based in France, and uh, obviously Axel, uh, my co-founder, uh, for preparing this event. You know, obviously we had to pivot um, in a, you know, we, we short notice from, uh, you know, physical and which is really what, what we love. So, you know, we hope that one day we'll still be able to uh, run event in, uh, you know, physically. Um, and, you know, in the meantime, uh, you know, we're working on our uh, value proposition online. Um, so really comforting to see, uh, you know, some of uh, your advice, you know, around kind of moving on, you know, kind of online content. Uh, and also, you know, kind of working on an online community. So we'll be, uh, you know, we're kind of going beta uh, now. So it's kind of all free, be able to kind of build your profile, talk about, you know, your wins, uh, publish press release, uh, you know, connect with uh, obviously other members. Um, and, you know, who kind of uh, challenge at the moment is to move all community of, you know, over uh, 3,000 past attendees um, kind of in the APAC zone uh, online. 
uh, and uh, obviously then kind of grow to new uh, geographies. Um, so um, yeah, so I think we are, we are in front of a massive opportunity and you know, more than ever, I think we need to stay uh, connected and um, you know, help each other, learn from each other. Um, you know, also mentioned that you know, if uh, you know, going, you're going through a, a difficult spell, we'll, we'll give you uh, some more information about uh, Cynthia's initiative. Uh, we created uh, some uh, kind of crisis package uh, with, with their company. Um, you know, where you can actually tap into uh, air expertise and air team's expertise um, on a pretty much daily basis, if I, if I, if I read correctly. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely uh, send you more information about our events next week. And we're preparing a roadmap for uh, the next three digital events. We change the time so we can capture uh, new geographies, uh, you know, including as we mentioned, uh, Singapore and Europe, um, as well as uh, North America. Um, we, yeah, so we'll be, uh, we'll be back next week. In the meantime, really, really uh, love your, uh, your feedback. Uh, you'll be directed uh, to an online survey. Uh, that would be fantastic if you could spare kind of a couple of minutes, give us some feedback, give us more ideas around, um, you know, how we can improve and, and, uh, help you, um, you know, to uh, actually thrive in this, uh, in this difficult time. Um, and uh, yeah, be the, make the, make the world a better place. Thank you for having us, Leo. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thank Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Enjoy your day. Bye, everyone.